Well, good morning, everyone. Like Jeff said, my name is Chris, and I am one of the leaders here at the church. Um, real quick before I share with you what I think that uh, one thing is that we've been talking about over these past several weeks, I just want to talk a little bit about the previous weeks that we've had with some of our dear friends of the church being able to come and share uh, what they think is the prominent thing in Jesus's ministry um, that we should be doing today. Um, Mainly because I feel like God is preparing us as a church to do something new, something different. Um, I feel like we're about to enter this new season of ministry together as a church. And I think a lot of the things that our friends have been sharing with us over these past several weeks have been speaking life into what's about to happen here at Renaissance. The first week, uh, we had Pastor Wayne Kent join us, and there's one question that he asked that stuck out to me the most. He said, if there is a mess that we can address, shouldn't we run there? I hear a yes over here. If there's a mess that we can address, shouldn't we run there? Two weeks ago, my dear friend, Jameson Wheeler, uh, he, he dropped this one-line statement that just resonated with me throughout the rest of the week and even to uh, today. He said, you can't have discipleship without relationship. And then last week, we heard from Pastor Chad Garrison, and he said that a disciple of Jesus is a person who follows Jesus. A disciple is a person who is transformed by Jesus. And a disciple is someone who joins him in the mission. And so I think all three of those weeks tie together quite well. And we have a big resounding statement that comes from all three of those weeks going into this week of a call for us as a church, the Big C Church, not just Renaissance, to get involved. And the last thing that Pat, Pastor Chad said last week a disciple is someone who joins Jesus in the mission, is where we're going to be picking up this week. But a mission um, that we're joining Jesus in is going to be a lifelong journey, not one that we're just getting to a destination and saying, I'm done. But a journey that's going to be lifelong. Now, a, a couple months ago, I began a new journey for myself, and we all know about different journeys, whether it's a, a job, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a road trip, whatever. At the beginning of a journey, we all know that it's going to be a little bit chaotic. It's going to be a little bit um, confusing at first as you begin to, to learn the ropes of how you're going to do what it is that you're destined to do. And so a couple months ago, um, I began a new journey called Marriage. Yay, you say, you're clapping now, but you don't even know. Kidding. <laughs> I need to be careful, the wife's sitting over there. Um, but anyhow, we began that new journey two months ago. And like I could tell you, yeah, there's a handful of different things I could expect marriage to look like, a glimmer of things that I would hope for. And some of you who are well-seasoned in marriage, you're probably going to laugh at me and be like, who gave this idiot a microphone? But at the beginning of it, I was, before we got married, I was thinking, man, I'm, I might actually have a little bit more time to read. I might actually have a little bit more time to relax. Now, I'm already getting people laughing at me. I'm, I'm a little bit hurt. But slowly but surely, I began to realize, yes, there are those things, but there's so much more. And I, I summarized it to probably three statements. The first being, I began how to, I'm learning how to clean a little bit better for the sake of my wife. Because Lord knows, and Tori knows, that organized messes made by Chris are not good enough. Granted, they're in a nice little pile now, but it's okay, I'm learning. I'm learning how to cook a little bit better. Um, granted, if you saw what I had every single evening for dinner in my bachelor life, you would be... Well, you might be impressed or you might be like, he needs to actually like eat healthy. I think I had tacos pretty much every single night, but there's nothing wrong with tacos, right? Um, and lastly, I think this is the one that I think will resonate the most with everyone. Learning how to communicate better. And if we're being honest, I'll just be honest so I don't make anyone uncomfortable. I'll be honest, it's hard. 
because we're not just talking about verbal communication, we're also talking about nonverbal communication with facial expressions and body language. And that's hard. Whether you're married, whether you're not, whether you're working with people, whether it's just the random people that you run into at Walmart. Communicating with people is hard. Speaking of communication, my favorite story about communicating over the past two months of being married. Uh, we had gone to a birthday party of one of Tori's cousins a month ago, and ever since we got married, I've jokingly told Tori, hey Tori, we're gonna get a dog. And she's like, no, we're not gonna get, get a dog because they shed, and she gave me this giant list of 50 million different things of why not to get a dog. So we go to her cousin's birthday party and slowly but surely we realize that her cousin got a brand new dog. So now they have two dogs. And Tori's like, oh, that's a cute dog, da 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 da. I'm like, yeah, Tori, we're gonna get a dog. And she's like, no, we're not. So we go home that night and we're getting ready uh, for dinner, getting ready for our Saturday evening uh, TV show of whatever we were watching. Um, and I'm walking to the kitchen and I see Tori just sitting on the couch scrolling on her phone. And I'm just like feeling this nudge inside of me, like, Chris, you need to ask her what she's doing. I'm like, okay, Tori, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, nothing. And like the, just the slight change in her voice was telling me she is about to buy something and I don't know what. <laughs> and so part of me is like slightly concerned. Is she like doing this big buy on Amazon, Target, whatever? And I'm like, Tori, what are you about to buy? And she spins the phone around and she shows me that she's been looking for dogs. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You just said you weren't gonna get a dog. And that began a brand new journey for us in the midst of marriage in the first, first two months. Isn't it wonderful? But we started a journey that night of looking for a brand new dog, and we finally found a dog. And so we were aware of this dog at the Humane Society here in town, and we're like, okay, we gotta find time this week to go and see this dog because it, it's probably, he's probably gonna get adopted that quick. And so we decided that we were gonna interrupt our work days and go and visit this dog on our lunch breaks. And so we go and meet him the very first day and we're like, okay, I think we probably could, could adopt this dog. He's, he's taking well to us. He's, he seems to like us. He hasn't really growled at us. <laughs> and so, so we end up leaving that day because they're like, we want you to come back another time so we can just see how he does in a, a, a couple days. And we're like, okay, that's fine. So we come back the next day, interrupting our work days again, just to come on our lunch break and meet this wonderful little dog. And so um, in the midst of that, that experience, we realized we're like, we want this dog. We wanna be the ones who are gonna be able to alleviate this dog's well-being, help him, help raise him up, give him a place to belong, um, and just raise this one-year-old puppy. And so we learned that day of his story. Now, real quick, I'll. It would be rude of me not to show my dog, because some of you are friends with me on Facebook, some of you aren't. And so there's cute little Gizmo. Isn't he so cute? And there's Tori. Um, oh, I think I said those backwards, my bad. Um, I'm just, yeah. I'm just gonna be quiet and we all can look at the dog. Yeah, there we go, okay. So his story, anyhow. Um, we learned that day that He's a one-year-old schnauzer puppy, and he's at the Humane Society, and we're, we're kind of like, okay, how did he end up here? And so the lady at the shelter was telling us, oh, well, he ended up here because um, his former owner was actually wanting to put him down because of how he's just a super hyper puppy, so he'll get along quite well with me. Um, he's a super hyper puppy, and he just would have the tendency of going around the house, get super excited, and pee all over the place. And I'm going to be honest with you, that day whenever she told us that, I had a full range of emotions, one being anger, because I'm like, how could you do that to a one-year-old puppy who just pees in the house? I was furious. I was very frustrated. So anyhow, we left that day and the lady's like, okay, we'll let you know. So we leave that day, we're going back to work and I feel 
God speak to me in, in that moment where I'm driving back here to the church. He's like, Chris, I want you to know that I love his former owner just as much as I love you. And I sat outside in front of the church for several minutes just trying to like process that. I'm like, man, that's so, so hard. But I know that his former owner is loved as, as much as I am. So the next day we go and we pick this little guy up and he becomes part of our family. We choose that he's gonna, we're gonna be advocates for him, that we're going to uh, be there to support him and raise this little excited puppy that pees all over the place and make him part of our family. That day, whenever we took him home, I felt God remind me again because there's, there'd been a handful of interruptions that had taken place that week. And I felt the Lord remind me that interruptions are invitations for us. They're invitations for us to know Jesus better. And sometimes those interruptions, they can come packaged like a little puppy dog, or those interruptions might come in the form of someone you run into at Walmart unexpectedly that you haven't seen in years. You might need to trust God more in a moment where you don't really know the full picture. You don't, you don't know how you can love a person because of A, B, C, and D. Jesus does. And so anyhow, I'm getting off my notes already. That's not a good thing. Um, but what I, was, what I learned that week of just dealing with all the dog stuff I learned a big lesson in compassion. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. That, that one thing that was prominent in Jesus' ministry that I believe should be prominent in the church today is compassion. More specifically, the way that Jesus had compassion to seek and save the lost. So anyhow, before we go any further into our Bible study this morning, I want to define something real quick with the word compassion, because I feel like we might have a variety of different definitions of what compassion actually is. And so one of the dictionaries that I pulled up, it said that compassion is having sympathy, it's having pity for others because of suffering and misfortunes. One of the commentaries that I was reading, it talked about how Jesus had compassion, and when it talked about that specific phrase, it's saying that Jesus is having a strong emotion to feel deep sympathy. Another definition that I found for compassion is being able to suffer together. My definition for compassion would be an awareness to alleviate suffering and advocate for people like Jesus did. So we're going to start our Bible study this morning in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And we're going to read to verse 38. And here's what it says. It said, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, in, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's take a minute to pray. God, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the way that you have brought us together here to glorify you, and to study your word together. God, I pray that you speak to us. I pray that you speak to us in a bold and mighty way to help us, to help us be compassionate like you. It's in your name that we pray. Everyone said amen. So up until this point in this passage that we just read, the disciples, they had been with Jesus for a period of time. If you look at some of the encounters that Jesus had prior to where he saw this crowd, you'll see that um, 
a mute man has been healed. You'll see that a girl has been restored to life. You'll see a woman who had ble been bleeding for years no longer is bleeding. Blind men now can see, and a paralyzed man was told by Jesus to pick up his mat and walk home. So to someone who wasn't a Jesus follower, they probably could say, that sounds pretty chaotic. That sounds pretty confusing. But Jesus is doing ministry. We saw how it, it's talking about how he's going throughout the cities. He's teaching. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, which is repentance, redemption, and restoration. And he's healing diseases and afflictions. So how did Jesus have compassion? You can see a multitude of different instances where it says Jesus had compassion on them. But Jesus had compassion on people in a handful of different instances, and it didn't say Jesus had compassion. I would venture out and even say compassion can sometimes be more than a feeling. Because sometimes for us to show compassion, it's going to push, push us outside of our comfort zone, and that can be hard. So how does Jesus ha have compassion? Jesus was aware of people. He alleviated the suffering for people, and he advocated for people. So that first way, Jesus was aware of people. There's a story in, in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus has this encounter with a man named Matthew who is a tax collector. Now, tax collectors during this time, they were, they were looked upon well by anyone in society. No one really liked them because they would always take a little bit more money from people's taxes than they were supposed to, and they would give the correct portion to the government, and they would take the rest for themselves. So people saw tax collectors as disgusting people. People saw tax collectors as deplorable people, people that no one wanted anything to do with. And so in Matthew 9... Um, Jesus tells Matthew, come and follow me. And so they go uh, to a house where there were a whole bunch of tax collectors and a whole bunch of sinners. And the Pharisees and other religious leaders came to this house and they saw who Jesus was having a meal with. And they're like, why is Jesus sitting with these people? How dare he? Does he not know who they are? And so Jesus tells the Pharisees, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. In Matthew 9, 13, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees a little bit more. He tells them this, he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. So, several different translations will say, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus was aware of people because he sat with them. The other way that Jesus was aware of people was he saw them. That passage that we read at the very beginning in Matthew 9, 36, it said he saw the crowds harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. That can mean a variety of different things. So what exactly was Jesus meaning when he said harassed and helpless? He's referring to people who are unable to help themselves. He's referring to people who have no protection, that have no guide whatsoever. During this time, the religious leaders, they would treat people quite unfairly. They would have harsh criticism toward them, leaving people to be harassed and helpless left with no spiritual guidance whatsoever. And so Jesus uses the perfect illustration here to, to describe them like sheep without a shepherd. Now, if sheep don't have a shepherd, there's three things that they lack. They lack provision, they lack protection, and they lack a path to follow. 
Whenever I was talking about this particular passage with Pastor Jeff, he reminded me of something uh, from one of the greatest Christmas movies, and this would be the second greatest Christmas movie behind number one, Die Hard. If, if you disagree, you can come fight me and Joe in the parking lot afterwards. I'm kidding. But he reminded me of, of, of a scene from the Christmas movie, The Grinch, where the Grinch is expecting his dog, Max, to pull this heavy sleigh. He's expecting him to pull something that is not meant for him. And that's ultimately what the Pharisees were doing. They were expecting people to pull weight that was not meant for them. So they are sheep without a shepherd. If sheep are left in a field long enough, they're going to graze the grass until it's bare. And if they don't have a shepherd, they can't be directed to a place where there's a better environment for them. They're going to be left to wander to somewhere. And that somewhere isn't always going to be great. And so what does Jesus do? How is he going to care for the lost sheep. After we read earlier about how there's these people who are harassed and helpless, Jesus has compassion on them, and he prays. And he tells the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And he says, pray earnestly to the Lord that there will be workers. So from that point, Jesus does something. He gathers the 12, and he sends them. And this is where we see the first of two ways where Jesus alleviated the suffering for people by sending the disciples um, to the lost sheep. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 7. What it says is, Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles. And enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. First glance at that passage, we can see Jesus telling the disciples to go to this place, but not this place. That is not Jesus saying, it's okay to ignore the people over here. The reason I'm sending you to the people over here is because they are sheep without a shepherd right now. They are lost sheep. There's a commentary that I was reading uh, about this, about the lost sheep of Israel, and I think it can say it a lot more eloquently than I can. So Jesus sent them to the lost sheep. So here's what the commentary said. It said, until Christ's death, which broke down the wall of partition. So that's a wall that kept Gentiles out of Jerusalem. Um, Until that wall was broken down, the gospel commission was for the Jews only. Okay? Though the visible people of God who were lost sheep, not merely in the sense which all sinners are, but as abandoned and left to wander, from the right way by faithless shepherds. So when Jesus is saying lost, what he is meaning is about those who are neglected. He's meaning those who have been led astray. He is talking about sheep without a shepherd. The second way that Jesus alleviated the suffering for people was speaking up for them. Hypocrisy and unbelief had been running rampant through the nation of Israel. And so Jesus was speaking um, to his disciples and to a crowd that had just heard some religious leaders teaching. And so Jesus confronts that in Matthew 23, verse 3, and he tells the disciples and a crowd. He says, they do not observe. They do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. So ultimately, having people pull weight that is not meant for them. The religious leaders were placing high expectations on people, saying you cannot do this, and would give them this large list. 
They would place all kinds of crazy burdens on people, ones that they couldn't even properly handle. So all the religious leaders' works were just a performance for people. So you could say in this, this very instance here that Jesus was being critically compassionate about hypocrisy in leadership. Pastor Tony Evans, one of the pastors that I'll listen to from time to time, um, he said this about the passage uh, we just read. He said, everything that the Pharisees did was for show. They wanted to be seen by others. They wanted observers to see how holy they looked, regardless of how dirty and ugly they were on the inside. The attitude of the Pharisees is not the attitude of a Jesus follower. The attitude of a Jesus follower is servanthood. And so Jesus calls the Pharisees to the table in Matthew 23, verse 13. And he says, woe to you. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. So what Jesus is trying to tell the Pharisees here in this moment is that the way that they're practicing their faith is not helpful. The way that they're practicing their faith is not beneficial. What their faith is doing is creating stumbling blocks for people. And if you, over a period of time, if you have just enough stumbling blocks, you create a wall a wall that, was, that Jesus came to tear down. Why? Because Jesus cares about people. And if, I'll get on a soapbox for a minute. If I'm being honest with you, I don't know that we have done well as Jesus followers over the past several years when it comes to caring for people well. We don't know what it looks like to be compassionate anymore because we are so caught up in every single distraction there is. And so some of those things that may have frustrated you this week, some of those interruptions you may have had, Maybe that was the Lord trying to talk to you and say, I need you to come and know me better. Because I can tell you after this week, and I have had a handful of nice little interruptions all throughout the week, but I think that was more of the Lord reminding me, draw close to me, draw close to me. Anyhow, back to this. The last way that Jesus um, showed compassion was that he advocated for people. He advocated for people. And so an advocate is someone who is going to support another. An advocate is someone is who is going to help a person stand. So as a young Hebrew boy, there's a passage um, in the Old Testament in one of the wisdom literatures that he would have read whenever he was young that he would have stumbled upon it in Proverbs 31, verse 8 through 9. And I think this really, um, I think this describes Jesus quite well. Verse 8, it says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So Jesus did that. Jesus did that and then some. Jesus didn't just say it, he lived it. He didn't just open his mouth, he suffered for us. He stood in our place as our advocate. 
I think there's an easier way to break down how Jesus was our advocate by looking at um, one of the last encounters that he had with his disciples in John chapter 13. But this is taking place hours before Jesus' death. In John 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all these things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Verse 5, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So hours before Jesus' death, which we just celebrated together in the act of communion, where we remembered that Jesus bled for us, that he died for us, that he broke his body for us. Hours before his death, he took the posture of a lowly servant to wash people's feet. In one of the verses, it said, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That shows us that Jesus was personal. What else this, this passage ends up showing us in verse 5? We're reminded how Jesus was in proximity with people. He was close to his disciples. He knew that, that he had to be in proximity so they could understand in order in order for them to serve people like he did, they had to be close. John 13, 5, it said, Then he pours water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He was close enough to wash their feet. So by serving his disciples, Jesus was showing he was showing them how powerful it is to serve people. How powerful it is to take the posture of a servant. In John 13, 16 through 17, Jesus reminds them. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus advocated for people by serving them, but he also did that by suffering for people. He suffered for us. We'll go real quick to Matthew, nope, not Matthew, Mark, Mark 15, verse 19 through 20. How did Jesus suffer for people exactly? He had been delivered to Pilate and he had, um, it had been determined that he was going to be crucified. Jesus was beginning to be mocked in Mark 15. Verse 19, it said, they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. Jesus shows us a lot about what compassion looks like. He shows us what living a life of compassion looks like and how to live it out practically. He was aware of people because he sat with them. He saw them. 
He alleviated the suffering for people by sending the disciples, just like he's sending us. He, he came to alleviate the suffering as an advocate for us. He serves, and then he died for us, taking our place. But one thing that I feel needs to be prominent for us today as a church, as Jesus followers, is to be compassionate like Jesus. And sometimes compassion is messy because you're sitting with people who need a glimpse of Jesus more than you may ever know. Compassion may be chaotic at times. It might be confusing. It's definitely not gonna be comfortable. But what I do know is this about compassion. Compassion does two big things. Compassion, it creates community. You want proof? Look at the disciples. But compassion does this too. Compassion brings us closer to Jesus and compassion compassion makes us more like Jesus because there are people everywhere that we go whether it's work whether it's school whether it's your weekly trip to Walmart that need to see a glimpse of Jesus more than ever. And if we're wanting more people to know the truth and the love and the grace and how Jesus changed us, we have to be the ones. We have to be the ones who are going to lead the way. And I can't think of a better way to lead the way to show people Jesus than by living out compassion just like he did. Let's pray. So God, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for the way that you have spoken to us here this morning through the words that we've read and the songs that we've sung. God, may we build our lives on your love. Help us, Lord, as we go throughout our week being able to be a glimpse of you for every single person that we come into contact with, whether we're sitting with them, whether we're seeing them, whether we're serving them. God, use us. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray.